Hey everybody, welcome back to Wednesday Night Fly Time. Uh, joining me tonight, back fresh from Mexico, is it back, fresh COVID the fearless test. leader, We're Brian Pitzer. Um, tonight's pretty <laughs> exciting. Uh, we got a really special guest. We're really excited about this. You may notice that uh, Brian and I made a playlist for each other tonight, which is, I mean, super exciting. It's awesome jams. It's but really romantic too, Matt. That's thoughtful. Of <laughs> a you. lot of thought went into this. <laughs> oh, uh oh, don't so, lose that. So anyway, welcome everyone. We're super excited to have a Traverse City native here, Gunnar Bramer, um, who actually got to start here at the Northern Angler, learning how to tie <laughs> flies. Um, so that we'll get to that. But uh, thanks again for joining us. Um, you know, we're super excited to post these things and bring them to you. Thanks it's, for the feedback. Yeah, it's been do really nice having people come in and say, you know, this was good, this was great, you know, and people can go back and watch that. And that that was the whole idea with this is that you can go back and rewatch these. If you're, you know, unable to watch all of them live, they're available for free right on our YouTube channel. So absolutely. Easy so peasy. Click um, the like and subscribe. Yeah, if you haven't um, done so, think about hitting that subscribe. I know we just launched a new Peak Rotary Vice nice video tonight. Nice job on that, oh, Matt. thanks. Yeah, that was that fun. Was really good. Tried Peak some new should stuff. use that, really. Yeah, made yeah. some royalties, you think? <laughs> <laughs> you should be an Instagram influencer. How many free vices can I get? <laughs> I need 20. <laughs> right. All right, let's get to okay. it, everyone. Uh, let's introduce our guest tonight. We have Gunnar Bramer, who, if you don't know... Who this guy is, you should, because not only is he a Traverse City native, and I mean, let's talk about how many really, really cool Traverse City tires there have been over the years. I mean, really, it's kind of it's kind of like the farm team for for the pro <laughs> for club, the big you know? leagues, yeah. Right. So, uh, Gunner, you're live now, so welcome to uh, live fly time with the Northern Angler, live from Traverse City, and you're in Minnesota, if I believe. Am I right? Minnesota, Duluth, yeah, yep. Yeah. It, I imagine it's cold there. Okay. Today's not bad. Today it was like 32 degrees or something oh, like that. Oh, man. And that's yeah. like, okay, but this is warm. Two weeks ago, it was 60 degrees colder. Wow. 60, 60 degrees, colder. degrees? What? Oh, yeah. Oh. And it was that way for like two weeks straight. I'm talking every morning, negative 27, negative 25. Oh, like, oh, no, we had to buy a new you. battery for my wife's car. It died like four days in a row. <laughs> We're like, screw this. So... Today was nice, sunny. I didn't have to shovel the driveway; it all melted. You like, were probably in shorts. <laughs> we had, this we is had what people. I wore all day. It was forty the other day. We had people in looking for yeah. flip flops, and I think oh, I they know. were going to spring break. But drive with the windows down. <laughs> right. Nice. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, welcome. What are we tying tonight? Yeah. Um, so tonight it's gonna be. I don't really know. So I, 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 got, I do know what we're gonna tie. But it's like when I was checking out your guys' YouTube channels. And I'm watching Lafkiss, and I'm watching Russ Madden. I'm like, oh, man, okay, they're bringing out the studs for the trout industry. It's like, we're not going to go there. You had a sick wiggle tail pike fly, so I'm like, okay, let's bring some diversity, and we're going to tie basically my variation of a tube jig. Fantastic. And I shouldn't really say it's mine because it's actually Bob Popovic's okay. silicone. And this was, like, way back, East Coast, stripe of fly. And, of course, in the East Coast, they got these bait fish called mullet. And mullet are very three-dimensional. And so if you look like, like a lot of classic saltwater patterns, like a deceiver, they have really low-profile snouts, right? Because all the materials, like low-profile bucktails tied in at the snout. And so Popovix is like, no, 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 no. We need some big, broad, beefy, three-dimensional. And so you have the really classic technique of stacking and packing a wool head, right? Right. But it's, it's not super durable. You get a few striped bass on that, maybe a bluefish. It's all ripped to shreds. And so Popovix, because he's a genius, took some silicone and rubbed it all over that wool. And it creates like the sickest, super slick, like no friction, with a massive trapped air pocket style head. And that hmm. thing will dart and glide around just like a tube jig, especially if you put a little bit of weight on it. Because Fantastic. it takes all the friction out of that fly. You get this perfect tubular silhouette. And we're going to dress the tail with ostrich. So you get all those little tentacles. And it's spot on like a four inch tube like you'd fish for smallmouth just about anywhere in the world so yeah fantastic i'm looking forward to this one i told you guys if you let me go i'll just i'll, <laughs> that's I'll good. the whole segment Absolutely. people love it and that's a, a great chance to um for me to kind of plug 
how to interact with this format that we have. Uh, we're using a little bit different programming tonight, but everything should be the same on your end on YouTube. So if you want to ask a question, a question of uh, any one of us, including Gunnar, of course, right. use the comment section down below. The chat window is what that is. If you're on your phone, get the app because you can't use the chat unless you have your app. So um, I know there's going to be a lot of questions about this, and uh, we'll try and moderate and keep the good ones and come up with some fun ones of our own. But, Absolutely. Uh, what? Uh, here's a softball lead-in for you. What hook are we tying on tonight? <clears throat> so this is a... I'm, I'm hesitating to switch to the DSLR because there's that little bit of lag. Sure, so no we, rush. We, we can see you great. Portion, and I think, uh, you know, if, can everybody see us pretty good out there? Close. Use those. We got a bunch of people watching, so everybody's saying things look and sound great so far. Nice. All right. Well, I'll, tell, I'll show you. I'll put my hand up here so you can probably see it. But this is the, the new A-Rex hook. It's the PR378, and it's the GB Predator Swimbait hook. Now, the GB is not an accident those would be my initials and so i pitched this idea to arex like three years ago because i'm also a gear fisherman and i wanted to basically be able to tie a beast fly weedless and i was like i need you guys to make an a dot hook only for musky and to my surprise they were like yeah sure we can probably do that I was like, not what I was expecting. I was like, you know, <laughs> go take a hike. Like, you're crazy. And so I sketched this whole thing out, dimensioned everything, came up with the specs I wanted, whatever. And uh, they ran into wire, or they ran into issues with the wire bending facility because it's a long platform. Because okay. you're taking basically a worm hook and then actually putting a tieable shank on it. And so the wire length for the 6 ot was too big to actually manufacture at the time. And coming into 2020... They picked up a new hook manufacturer and they're like, we're going to run with it. So we did a whole collaboration with Paul Monaghan, who's notorious for sure. kind of these weedless rigging pipe tubes with Texas hooks. And we respect the whole thing out, dimensioned everything out and got it manufactured this fall, which has been crazy cool to finally have it, you know, a real idea in hand. That's sure. so cool to have, you know, an idea to work on it, you know, break it down and refine it and then. Hold it in your hand. So when you guys see this fly that we're tying, it's literally, if you were to look at a swim bait, it's a swim bait. I mean, it's it's straight up like a, a plastic, soft plastic lure with a weedless hook design. It's going to be nasty because <clears throat> it just is. It is nasty. But like you're talking about going fishing north of Wisconsin's mom old bass, you're in the north woods. Uh, anyway, I'll just bring it even back to the Great Lakes. But fishing this thing on those rock shoals, especially the sand flats in East Bay, because that's where all the gear guys are fishing. They're all fishing brown and olive tube jigs. Right. Yep. It's like this right. thing is the most perfect goby imitation you ever saw. And the coolest thing about it is when you bring it up here, it's weightless. So you could fish this thing and, like, if you were to go on Lake Skiumog and you go to that little north side where the river inlet goes up to Elk and it's just full of stumps, like, all over the place and it's terrifying. Right. There are brute smallmouth in there. And this thing, you could fish this thing 100% confidence, not a chance of getting hung up whatsoever. Really? And it would be on the money. I'll have to try that. Definitely. Excuse to go fishing? We can handle that. We can handle that. <laughs> <laughs> all so, right. Yeah. Well, fantastic. That's, that's the, the and we do carry of those hooks. hooks at the shop. Yeah, so. absolutely. And not to, you know, put the plug in there too early, but uh, if you're looking a way to support any of our videos, you can help us out by buying materials. Simple as that. Once we complete this, we already had a question about material list. We didn't really decide until, what, 1 o'clock? I think Gunnar and I got together and decided what we were going to... Um, end up tying. End kind of up tying, so... We'll all go back and I'll put a material list together. And, uh, you know, if you can't buy it from us, that's okay, too. Uh, try and support your local shop. Yeah. That's what this is all you, about. So. You guys will have this. This thing is, like, bare bones simple. Okay, we're talking, like, if I just eyeball it. Like, literally, like, four materials, not including, like, hooks and stuff. But <clears throat> we're going to run a little bucktail base. Everybody's got bucktail. The best thing about this fly, we're tying it on the 2 watt. Uh for the reason that the hooks are scary big, okay? They're they designed huge. They to are. be a large platform, weedless, four, six, eight-inch flies 
for predator fishing. That was the whole point. And there's going to be smaller sizes coming, but that's not what we did for the initial run. And so I want to try to show this on the 2 watt so that it's a little bit more accessible to the people who might have more of a dry fly nymph background. Because if you hold the 6 out, there's not a chance you're, you're going you're to tie <laughs> that thing. you got to have, like, pure pike genes to be like, yes. So I short have... bucktail. <laughs> It's like it's only a four inch fly, right? So right. it's like you're talking like three and a half inch bucktail, which every fly shop is gonna have. Like this is cream Pretty of the crop. Pretty standard, yeah. I will admit I hoard premium ostrich. You want some decent ostrich, but some decent ostrich will go a long yeah. way. And then we're just gonna stack and pack Icelandic sheep hair. Okay. Fantastic. And the reason why, uh, I've always had the hardest time ever finding really high quality wool. And it's just it's either too coarse or it has colics in it or you tie it in and you get those thread valleys and people they always buy this for predator tie-in and it's really long and wispy and what's cool is when you you take all the under fur out you actually have what's useful for predator tying which is the long straight fibers right and then all of the under fur is like the most premium wool you've ever seen and my guess is everybody who's ever tied a predator fly has this on hand and they're like what do i do with this because I don't know, because nobody uses it. So we're going to stack and pack some Icelandic sheeps here and build a three-dimensional tubular bait fish with silicone. Fantastic. Just sweet. Might have to run out and get some silicone. Yeah, that's bad to the bone. <laughs> Walmart, and Walmart carries GE2. And it doesn't matter what brand you use, but I'm going to use GE2 household silicone. This is 2 plus, doesn't matter. But the GE2 brand is just... Oh, no, someone will ask oh, exactly yeah. which silicone you <laughs> GE2 plus. <laughs> GE2 plus. And is the it, only reason is so that it doesn't have a super ammonia smell. That's the only reason. And you want um, clear. They have different colors. They have black and white stuff. You want clear. It'll be a little milky if you put it on like a dark olive or a brown. But yeah, clear is what you want. Better hide it though when you're bringing it home so no one thinks you're doing a house project this weekend. And, you know, <laughs> right. You know, no, no, no. This, this was for fly time. No, I, oh. I thought you were going to redo the bed. It's for fly time. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, <laughs> Dave. <laughs> we're ready to, ready to hop in yeah, whenever. let's do it. Yeah. All right. I'm going to get the DSLR popped up. So if you let's don't know, Brian here. just spent the last week down in Mexico chasing permit, uh, which... We had a great time down there. Some awesome pictures. Hopefully, uh, uh, they will be on limited release uh, over the next... Uh, over the next few yeah. months, we did, we, you know, I didn't land my permit. Uh, Lindy and Jimbo got their permit. Ben and I struck out. Ben's still down there for another week. And he hooked one today, fought it for a while and lost it. Big one sounds like. Big one. Yeah. And uh, I hooked a big one the first day, wrapped the line around the reel because I was wading up to here. So that was pretty tough. But we caught a bunch of bonefish and tarpon and and uh you know baby tarpon were super fun that's something i would definitely will do again uh had a few trigger fish follow that was fun caught some jacks so it was a good time great time to be away the weather wasn't the best uh but it was certainly better than the midwest so <laughs> yeah all right it looks like a heck of a lot better in duluth gunner is ready to go here all with right. his. we're gonna split down into uh the big cam here, so everybody can see exactly what's happening on Gunner's vice. Awesome. Put it on. So this is this is the hook, and I'll I'll show it. Of course, I'll show it to you without materials on there. But the whole point uh, is that you can tie basically weightless flies completely hook point up. Uh, all the flies use kind of an extended body technique, which means we're going to fill literally the hook gap here, this massive empty space, uh, with a little shank and kind of extend the body almost like you would on saltwater extended body deceivers and things like that. Um, and it's going to allow you to tie a weedless hook point up that you can dredge over zebra mussels, throw into timber, fish thick cabbage, and you're ready to rock. And the one thing that this hook has that kind of makes it really special over your kind of typical Texas style is the hook point is massively offset. So you see, when I rub my, my fingers through this, you know, I get that hook point every single time. It's right here in the top wing, which means that it's weedless, but it's not fishless. Because you can have one and one in the same, right? You can make a fly so weedless that you don't stick anything on it. And that's the big trouble with Texas hooks, is everything's in the same plane. 
And then when you look at it, you have this awesome long tying shank. So you can actually fit a full-size stacked wool head, bucktail deceivers, bulkheads, everything that you're doing is going to fit on that shank. You're actually going to have a tieable shank. Now, I'm going to run this fly with a little glass rail. And that's, that's the whole reason why there's these linear bends in here, so that you can actually fit rattles <clears throat> on the 45 or the flat section. And what's really cool is you should experiment with this fly basically on a weightless platform, but also a lightweight platform and weighted platforms. Because the hook, if you look at this, if you draw a straight line, only this little bit of wire is technically putting leverage on that hook. All of this drop down, 45, flat, linear, even up into the bend is all keel weight. So when we tie this fly, everything, even weightless flies, which is super critical, because if you take a, you could take this exact recipe, convert it, you have to weight it, and the weight has to be relative to the weight of the hook and the, the length of the dropper arm, and make sure that you have the right leverage so that it rides true, right? And tying it this way allows you to basically tie weightless, lightweight, heavyweight, no matter what you're doing, it's gonna ride true and be functional. So I'm gonna tie this whole fly with monofilament thread. This is something that's kind of uh, very much so, again, Popovic, you know, style, East Coast style. This is eight thousandths of an inch. It's like eight pound or six pound breaking strength. It's hard stuff. It's basically like 150 strand GSP. Um, and what's really cool is it's round. So it always has a lot of bite. That round thread's gonna have a lot of bite. You don't ever have to spin it or do anything. And when we're tying this fly, you're gonna see I'm gonna integrate uh, a lot of CA plus into that mono. And what happens is the mono and the CA plus undergo a chemical reaction that'll plastic weld all the fly. And so you end up with basically the most durable build because the, the, the materials, the thread, it all gets welded together, especially with synthetics, not really with the naturals, but the thread will weld itself into a ball of plastic. You literally won't be able to get it off. Uh, if you go like take a razor blade to it, it'll take you for flipping ever, like five or 10 minutes just to get your fly part. Now I've always hated putting rattles on flies, especially glass rattles, because they roll like crazy. And so I have a big bundle of monofilament. Now this mono, I took the memory out of it. So I boiled it in a pen and then shocked it with cold water. So it's all perfectly straight, no memory. It's called uh, mono straights. I got a little YouTube video on how to make it, but I cut off a little tiny section. I don't know if you can see that, it's very small. And I'm gonna stack that literally onto the side of my hook here. And I gotta stack another one on the other side. And I pre-cut these so that you didn't have to watch me do it. It's one of those time sucks right there. And so what happens is with a piece on either side, you get a nice rectangular base. And you could do this on any fly that you put a rattle on at all. And now when I take this little rattle, it's only a three millimeter glass rattle, and I put it up in here, there's not gonna be any roll, no wobble, no nothing. It's not gonna jackknife because it's got a nice flat rectangular base to hang out on. But I'm just gonna drop down here with the kind of Oh, that all shocked up. You see that? Embarrassing social media moment. Let's get hey, Gunnar, what was the uh, what was the thickness on that thread again? So the thread is eight thousandths of an inch, which is 0. 0.2 millimeters. Okay. And so if you look at that rattle, it's now zero zero eight on the spool, probably, right? Yeah, uh, it's Vivas, so it's, it's oh. <laughs> registered as 0. 0.2. 0. Okay. 2 gotcha. Okay. But that's, it's been my all-time favorite Predator thread. And while I'm talking about it, of course, it's, it's a brand new spool. And it's, when it's at its widest diameter on the spool, it's easier to slip off the edge, which is one of those things that can happen when you're fishing with flower carbon. No, this is mono, sorry. I was trying to be Al <laughs> Linder for a second. Today, folks, we're going to have uh, a <laughs> recipe for walleye. <laughs> So again, I'm going to hit that with the zap, and all that mono thread will now bind to itself and create a big ball of plastic encasing that rattle, more or less, and then just touch that up. So I did that first because it's kind of a lot of zapping gap, and I don't really want all my materials getting super glued to this bad boy. So we're going to pop that out, and what we're going to do, I guess I'll show you real quick, but I talked about tying an extended body. I talked about filling this gap with material. And the way we're going to do it is quite simple. We're going to tie on a shank. 
we're going to put a mono trace out of the shank and tie it down so it's fixed right here. And you'll see it runs perfectly in line and it keeps that hook point offset. You can fill the gap with anything you want. And what's the sickest thing about it is that means the patterns don't have to be tailored to the hook because you're not trying to fit a whole pattern in this short little section. You can take any pattern that would fit on your typical single hook platform and make it weedless. You just have to break it into two components. So we're going to pop that guy out and put, this is a 20 millimeter shank from Flyman Fishing Company. I'm going to run it perfectly in line with my jaws because I'm going to put a stack of bucktail on it. I don't want it, my vice jaws to get in the way. If you were to put it up, when you try to spin bucktail symmetrically, it's going to hit the bottom of the jaw and force it out kind of in a way. Yep. Now, when you start your thread on a shank, if you start way up at the hook eye, it'll get a little flimsy, especially on the 35s. But if you start on the double R bend, it'll secure itself because you got both wire diameters helping you out there, and you won't get a super flimsy ride. And now I'm going to come in again with those mono straights that I talked about. I'm just going to take one. It doesn't need to be long. These are maybe, you know, six inches, and I'm going to basically cut that in half so I don't waste too much of it. I'm just going to pin that straight to the top. It's a little hard putting round on round, so you got to use your fingernails here. Keep it nice and centered, and you can just walk that to the hook eye. And now I don't need to use this full shank. I really don't. I'm just putting a tail stack on it to fill in the gap, so I'm actually going to come right at the base of that double R bend, and that's where I'm going to start the fly here. You see, I just have this perfect piece of straight mono, no memory whatsoever, sticking out the nose, and that's literally going to attach right there and fill that whole gap. Wow, that's cool. And then if we come in, again, that CA Plus is going to plastic weld that together. And now what's really cool is because we used a monofilament extension, the monofilament extension is going to get bound to the monofilament thread and this is literally going to be one big core of plastic that can't separate it can't ever pull off there's no tension on it anyway but it can't ever pull off and i should specify something about the monos this is pretty big you can obviously you can see the diameter on the camera but it's 28 thousandths of an inch which is like 60 pound and the whole reason is we're using the stiffness of the mono to apply leverage to the hook now the two odd it's not really a big deal but if you come into like the four or you come into the six, these are pretty heavy. Right. And it's a lot of rear hook weight. If you look at that hook, that's a lot of weight in the back and they'll sag a little bit. Now, when you put an extended body on it and you have the connection of that extended body relatively stiff, the water friction that's going to be on the shank is going to lift up and it's literally going to flex the mono, which will put down pressure on the nose and it'll balance the whole system out. Now, that's critical to know when you tie it weightless. But we're going to weight this one nose heavy so that the fly has quite a bit of momentum so that it glides and dives like a tube, tube jig, right? That's kind of the whole point of the fly. Right. So this is going to be nose weighted, which will balance everything out, kind of defeats the purpose. So I'm just using a single strand. That's why the rigging's not very complex. Now, again, I talked about just simple bucktail. This is not premium bucktail. This is everybody's bucktail. You have this in your basement. You know, this isn't like... Uh, watching a video with Gunner, and I pull out my seven-inch bucktail. I'm like, come on, people. Let's make a beautiful fly. We had a guy in the other day that's like, yeah, I do custom bucktails, and he showed me this picture, and they're all, like, <laughs> way wider than my head. And I was like, holy cow. That's, yeah. Popovich that's some work. Presidential. He literally <laughs> hoards them. He... <laughs> and I don't blame him. When I have a big tail, I don't do anything with it. Well, that's not true. I'll do, let's see if I can pop that off. I'll do something like that. What? But, or you'll tie flies for yourself, right? I mean. Oh, yeah. These, <laughs> these stay at home. Those are special bugs. So anyway, I took my bucktail. Now, when you cut it off uh, the hide, wherever I put it, I kind of took it from the premium section. Uh, this doesn't need a lot of flare. If you get down here, it'll be flare omega. It's kind of like deer hair down in here. And you can just pick it out. You can tell feeling it, the coarseness and the springiness. The more coarse and springy it is, the more trapped air. This is pretty dead hair. It's going to flare a little bit, but it's going to be very controllable. This bucktail has a nice little bit of crinkle to it, which helps fill it in. I don't like straight bucktail. I always like a little crinkle in the process. And it's a fairly dense patch because we're only going to do one tail stack. Everything after this is stacked, basically stacked uh, Icelandic sheet. 
Now when you treat this, I'm going to come in and get a perfectly clean vertical cut, completely clean. And if you're not used to bucktail work, this is a, well, it's tricky. It's something to practice. But you need to be able to put that clean cut perfectly vertical on that hook, just like that, or I guess that shank. And if you take your thread and spin it counterclockwise, if you look over it, you'll see when I bring this thread up and relax, it's super tight against my fingers. You see that against my fingernail? That's a great And as trick. I stitch that down, I have complete control over where that goes. And I might have lost like three strands, but it's not a big deal. And so it was all on top. And I shove my thumbnail in it really, really hard, and it moves it off to the sides, and then I can kind of just pinch it, manipulate it, try to get it as round as I can. And it's under a little bit of tension. My hand's always on that bobbin when I'm doing stuff. So it's just always controlled. And then I can reef on it. And now I can just maneuver it around those jaws and make sure it's perfectly symmetrical, even. And you can see that density is very consistent all the way around. There's no mishaps. And that's just material handling. You know, that's not even like technique. Like you just beat it's the crap work. out of it under tension. <laughs> beat the crap out of it under tension and it'll be more or less symmetrical. And now that it's the way I like it, I can just kind of walk it back and collapse that. And this is something that's super critical with any bulkhead or hollow fly. But as I took my thread back, the pressure was lighter. Because if I were to wrap back really hard, it would reflare and recompress. And I didn't want that. I wanted to collapse it. The only reason this has flare right now is because of my vice jaws are just flaring it out a little bit. That's the only reason that has flare on it. And then I'll just hit that with a little bit of welding magic. Now I'm going to come in with just flash. And, of course, this is optional. Well, this is polar flash. Any flashable will do. But... If you can see the texture, it's very scaly. And this Good is blend probably, of fibers. I like it's, that. It's, it's nylon woven flash boo is what it is. And that nylon weave, it gives the flash boo crinkle and texture. And there's only one nuance to it, but the nylon weave will catch teeth every once in a while. And you'll see I'll come in with just a little finger, like a little picker out comb, and I'll pick out all the nylon. But regardless, the flash is my kind of my favorite for fish texture. And so I'll just measure that off, maybe like a half inch longer than the bucktail. And that I'm, I'm going to want some symmetry here. So I'm going to cut that to equal lengths. And I hate flush edges. They're like the enemy, man. <laughs> Come in and just pick that out. It doesn't have to be severe, but you just want to put some taper in that. Absolutely. Now, now the way I'm going to treat this, this is a pretty wide diameter base, and it's really hard to get the flash should be perfectly distributed, and I want it tied in the round. So what we're going to do is we're just going to treat top, and then this stuff is going to go under, under the bottom. So I'll wrap it on my bobbin here, pin it straight to the top, and now I can let it kind of just fold and fall away. And I can really work on that, get the top nice and wide and veiled, right? So it's the same technique as the bucktail. Flared it with my thumbnail, and now I have it basically 180 over the back. I can rotate to the underside and just... Bring that up and back, catch that on the other side with one thread turn, put the veil into it, and now I have perfect 360 bucktail all over that, not bucktail, but flash bill all over the bucktail. And this is where, again, I kind of hoard premium ostrich because it's, it's hard to find. When I see it at a fly shop, I'm like, yeah, I'll take all of them. I'll just <laughs> buy all of, your, all of your ostrich. They're not super fond of that. They usually don't know what I'm doing. And so I can get away with it. But we're going to basically just counter Just tell him you're fly. tying swing flies, you know. And he'll be like, oh, he's one of those guys, yeah. No, I'm, I'm sacrificing it to the e -socks. So, <clears throat> But I'm going to counter shade this just because it's cool. And then I'm, I'm going to show you how to stack the head high and tight and then kind of get it symmetrical instead of packing in the round. Packing in the round, you can obviously do, especially if you're going to do like an olive jig or a dark brown jig, something more gobious, you can just stack it in the round. Uh, but this allows you to countershade it and make an actual bait fish, whereas kind of tube jigs are always stuck being unicolor, right? Right. And so we're going to be like, monochromatic. No, <laughs> unicolor? I'll just make up words. It's not a big deal. <laughs> you must be. You sure you didn't tie with rust before? <laughs> yeah. I've, no, I've, I've, caught, I've caught steelhead with rust before, <laughs> but I've never. I don't know if I know tie. anyone who has their own language more than Russ. He definitely has his own <laughs> Russisms, and we love them here. You know, send we them do. to the army. Yeah, or uh, what, yeah, what's the send other one? Them the army. <laughs> oh, this isn't arts and crafts. This is arts and crafts. This is not arts and crafts. 
Now this is a kind of a gross amount of ostrich that I'm going to use, even though I'm stacking it top and bottom. An ostrich, man, it, it slicks down to just about nothing in the water. It really does. There's not a lot to it. So this is probably like, I don't know, 15 or 20 strands. And that's all going to go right here at the bottom, just a hair longer than that bucktail. And I'm going to treat it just like the bucktail. So I'm going to cut it perfectly vertical. Come in here and just pin that right there. And then I can take that thumbnail and just make sure it's, look at that, like it's oh, not nice. all in one spot. Nice. And that's just your your fingernail going right on that thread wrap. And what's really nice is because we got the mono coming out, this hook I doesn't need to be clean because we don't need to put anything in it, right? The mono's sticking straight out the shank. So you can crowd away, my friends. Don't don't worry about the hook. Wow. I don't hear that too often. Right. Yeah. Gunner, did you try any other materials before ostrich for this? Or did you know, did you tie it initially with just the bucktail? So I've tied here, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll switch to the Just other always game curious about the genesis set. of materials in a fly and things like that. Yeah, I hear you. Um, so let me get this tied in here. All right. Don't let me distract you. No, I'll hold court. I just, <laughs> it seems like an important topic that'd be worth going over. So this is one of those things right here where I'm obviously using ostrich. The idea behind the tube jig, it seems very applicable. You know, it's, it's actually how like how more accurate can you get besides silicone rubber legs but like ostrich has that same tone vibe and all that vibration and movement out the back really just on its own without you needing to do anything to it um and i guess i've been I've been running my mouth so much with this thing on the fly i just want to see other people for a second here <laughs> <laughs> so here let me let me run to the other camera yeah you're good if you guys hear my, my camera turning on and off, it, it doesn't like the, the transition here. <laughs> Nobody no likes worries. transition. Change is scary. Oh, there he yeah. is. There you go. All right. So Deep uh, if you look at Popovic's uh, vari uh, variation, it's his pattern. If you look at Popovic's version, uh, he ties the tail with hackles. He takes saddle hackles. And he puts this big base of bucktail down, and then he stacks hackles in the round. Instead of pairing them deceiver style, he stacks them in the round because he's imitating a nice tubular bait fish, right? So he's tying accurate to the forage. Which you should always tie accurate to the forage. I don't care what you're doing, tie accurate to the forage. Um, <clears throat> and so he ties that in the round. And because this is being extended into a weedless design and it has to split the hook, I want fibers. I want individual strands because if I take some big hackles, they're going to get wrapped around and then it's going to start to fall. But if you always have fibers, even if they wrap around, it still looks right in the water. Sure. So the whole point of uh, moving to the ostrich, of course, when I thought tube jig, that's what I wanted because it's very, like, just accurate. It's, you know, dead on accurate. But it has function beyond that as far as its ability to look correct without following around a hook point being extended into the middle of a fly, basically. And still having to split the hook point. Perfect. So that's that's, and when you tie, because I should mention, I talked about how you could tie it on a jig hook, right? You could tie it on a 60 degree or a 90 sure. degree jig hook, especially if you were hoping to get more offset or maybe less weedless and more, you know, if you just want a more exposed point, you can take the same pattern. The only difference is you have to get the weight fine tuned for that hook, because so how many people tie on a jig hook don't use enough weight and it rides upside down and they're irritated. <laughs> to say yep. to say the least. Would you still put the rattle on the bottom of the jig hook? Um, so I'm going to post a video of this coming up. But Paul Monaghan has something called a mono rig. And he'll take a little section of mono looped back. Oh, I totally have one on the desk. Hang on a sec. Oh, <laughs> let, me, yeah. let me find this. <laughs> Here it is. Oh, yeah. I'll show you how I do it on a tube jig. Because this is what it's all about. This is what Q&A is all about. Okay, that's I'll right. Get you that's guys right. <laughs> well, it's just going to be on us for a second while Gunner switches over. So yeah, that didn't deal with it. Oh, that was, Check oh, that that's out. Smooth. Let's switch so, over. What you can do here, you take that uh, mono straight that I have. If I could get this stupid clip out of here, <laughs> this one, that would be cool. <clears throat> So if you take that the mono straights that I showed you earlier, yeah, and you make a little loop on the back of your hook, you can then tie a rattle, any yep. replaceable rattle, 
on a section of two and slide it on. Oh. And then that rattle you know, becomes replaceable depending on the length of your tube. You can change three millimeter, four millimeter, five millimeter, large plastic fly rattles. So then you can play with how the weight impacts the action of the fly. If you want more momentum in the back, if you want to help balance the hook out and put weight in the back so it drops down. And what you do is you take a fly clip or like a mustad fast hatch, and then you clip it in there. And now the tube can't come out, but you still have access to being able to replace it. So I would put it at the back end of a tube jig and not put it actually on the shaft. And sure. then you have the option to totally change it out, transfer it, change the weight. If it breaks, replace it. Which is really smart, especially if you're doing a single hook. Um, uh, I think it's Matt Grzewski does, uh, puts a rattle on the back end of his yard sale too, just for balance. And the first time I saw that, I was like, man, why didn't I think about that? And he just hides under some flash, no big deal. That Paul Monahan video is great. I. I'll admit, I think I watched it at least two or three times just to understand what he was talking about. Yeah. The first time it's I was so like, cool. whoa, that's... That's, that's where the whole idea for the, the swim bait rigs came up with, man. It, as soon as I saw him extend something into that gap with monofilament and connect everything, I was like, that that's it. Like, that's the solution to taking that six-dot weedless hook and tying a, you know, an eight-inch pattern on it. That's Sorry. so cool. I, I crossed a lot of, there was a lot of different references. <laughs> no, no. That, uh, I'll go back and I'll, uh, I'll try and put some links down to, to Paul and uh, some other stuff well, down there so you guys can all see that yeah. later on. That's a cool rig. That's slick, I believe. It's slick. I have craziness going on in front of me on the ground, but I found the hook. Nobody <laughs> worry. I found it. I got like seven hooks out on the table. It's not ideal. But this is our hook, right? It's dressed with that three millimeter glass rattle. And then we're going to be able to pop that sucker right there in that gap. And something that's kind of critical to the lengths. Uh, I really like the two out for like a four inch fly. And the reason why is you really want that hook mid body. You want to make sure that when a fish comes up and, and grabs that, again, you take your finger. If you can find the hook with your finger, a fish is going to find it more or less. And it's right there every single time. My finger, I'm not stopping that. I'm hooking myself on purpose. <laughs> and so that mid-body hook is, is critical for high hookups. If you have like a six-inch fly on that little two-aught, you're going to miss a lot of fish because they're yeah. just not going to find it. They're just not going to find it. That's a that's such a good tip. I was, I was tying some uh, Bufords the other day, and I was like, man, this seems... It seems a little long for just one hook, and... I kind of came to that same conclusion, although not the thought wasn't as well formed as that. <laughs> I'll admit that you know it should be right around midpoint too, because then there's less density from that bucktail, so that they can get right into that hook. So for sure, and I think thing, you know, you know not to compliment total, you compliment you too much, but I think rabbits. you've done more. You've done a really, really good job over the past few years presenting really well thought out concepts for tires out there. And Your I know so many amazing. people, they're just like, oh, it finally makes sense. It's like music theory in a way, which will never make sense to me. Sorry, mom. <laughs> I tried. But, it, it, you know, it's it's finally explaining why the way things are. You know, it's it's I love it. And I know a lot of people that have really appreciated the work you've put into that. So us included. Yes. Thank you. That's, We've probably borrowed some ways a to explain com things. Compliment. I really appreciate that. It's got, you know, I'll, I'll just jump into the fly because now I'm blushing a little bit. <laughs> but, um, so you can uh, do two things with these eyes on here. So I'm going to weight this, and I'm going to weight this. Don't be scared by the size. They're large lead eyes. They're not actually large. It's just the way the hairline packages them. They're called heavy <laughs> lead eyes. And the size large, they're only 4.8 millimeters, which is a medium lead eye. Yes. So they're not actually crazy big. Um, the important thing is they weigh one gram. You should, I would really highly recommend getting a, a grain scale and weighing all your eyes. So you know the difference between lead and brass and tungsten and tungsten cone heads and brass cone heads, because it changes castability and the action significantly. You know, if you have a small eye and it's 0.6 grams or a heavy eye and it's one gram, it's twice the weight. Like, it's significant. And so these lead eyes that I'm going to tie on, they're one gram. And what's really cool is it gives the fly some sick momentum. Like, you strip it and it goes. 
Okay, that's the whole goal is to imitate a tube jig. Now it's still a slippery fly weightless, but if you want that glide tube jiggy action, you want it to be pretty nose heavy. And at the end of this video, you should remind me uh, to talk a little bit about casting a heavy fly, just so the people who watch this don't, you know, Impale break their themselves. elbows. <laughs> yeah, just a little casting tip. But anyway, the position of the eyes this silicone head traps a lot of air if when you see the finished product you'll understand that if i took a razor blade to this there's literally a core of nothing there's just hair that has no silicone on it so inside this layer of silicone there's a miniature version of this same shape that is an air pocket in the water and the air does not come out and so you can put these lead eyes way back in the shank and get a fairly suspendy glidey fly or you can put them farther up and get a nose dive fly because it's, the lead eyes have to balance with the air pocket to get the right desired action. I shouldn't say right action, the desired action that you're going for. So you'll see, I'll just kind of vaguely back these up and put them farther back into the fly so they're not super close to that eye. They're like midsection, maybe even a little bit farther back so that I can get some trapped air up in here and help support that nose weight. And I'm just going to figure eight these, your typical... You know, lead eye technique here. Put some underturns on there and get that locked in. I should apologize. I'm, I haven't tied on a pedestal in, I don't know, probably two or three years, which is why it's moving around a lot. But Let's all hand on the end. And you just take this mono extension. You pin that circle at the top. You can just Amazing. spin it. Like, I can control that orientation, right? You just spin that so that you're happy with it. And then I can control, basically I could put thread underneath it and lift it up, or I could walk it down the bend and flare it down, but I want that nice and perfectly linear. Just get that right on there. And again, you don't need to go berserk here with tying that in, because we're going to plastic weld that with the CA+, and this will all just be rock solid. Now, let me clean that up. Everybody stroke your fly here. I was practicing this this afternoon and just gouged my finger up so <laughs> bad. <laughs> we all do that. It's so good. I, you're, you are going to want a rag. I should mention that. Or paper towel. Blood Not rag. Just for bloody, just for bloody hands. But, <laughs> so you can get the silicone off your fingers, off your bodkins. It's, it's going to be pretty critical to, to finishing the head here. So I'll mention that now. But all we're going to do is we're going to come in and we're going to fill this whole thing with Icelandic sheep hair. And I want to show you basically how you're going to do it. You take out a tuft of this stuff. And the, I'm telling you, the wool on this is so unbelievably prime for stacking a wool head. And you can see I'm really working on it. I'm trying to get pretty tight to that core because I want the base fibers. I want the stuff closest to the hide. I'm going to cut off a massive chunk here. That is a massive chunk. That's... <laughs> but check, check that. Well, I gotta, I'm going to pack this pretty tight. You don't have to pack it this tight, but I'm just going to take my comb and watch this thing just disappear. Now, I might have enough wool to probably do two of these. We'll see. Like, that's all premium chartreuse wool. Absolutely wow. premium. This would make a great single stack wing on a pike fly. Just to counter shade a pike fly or tie even like a, well, I don't know. I'm not going to tell you what to tie with it, but a nice little overwing there or tailing material, anything like that. And so what I do is when I'm prepping these flies, understand this is all pike hair. So you just put this in a different plastic bag, and now when you're tying your pike flash, you don't have to comb the underfur out. Or when you do, you save the underfur, and then you have a different application for packing a wool head with underfur. So save that stuff, because normally all this wool would be thrown away, but I'm going to show you how to use it. Now, right now, you got a bunch of different lengths, and none of it's in the same orientation. Now, when you do this, I'm, I'm physically grabbing it and pulling out a chunk, and the friction of the fibers getting drawn against each other puts everything in the same orientation, right? So I can create nice kind of long fibers that I can pack at the midpoint, and they're all going to lay perfectly back, and they're not going to fall very much, and they're not going to trap around your thread. So I'm technically, I call this rip stacking, but I'm giving the fibers 
the proper orientation so that they can be applied to the hook. And I'm going to do that same with some white. And like the white is premium length, but Whoa, that's long. It's that's all nice. the it's all the wool that I want right here. Yeah, I think I think wool is something that's really baffled a lot of folks over the years and that's part of the reason there's been I think this mass run to synthetics because they're friendly to tie with yeah. a lot of them are really really friendly but there's there's, some. there's still a reason to you know <clears throat> you'll never replace something like a natural material I mean it's not not gonna happen but I mean, a wool still has a really cool spot in flies, and I don't think enough people I don't toy think with enough it. people don't. play with it. But this is, I'm excited to try this to get some, because I, I agree, it's been so hard to get a large quantity of usable material in terms of wool over the years. That it's is like been, two and a half, three look inch at that. premium wool. <laughs> oh my yeah. God. Wow. And it's just Icelandic sheep hair, and 90% of the people who tie with sheep hair would throw this away. Yeah. Like this is this is your water absorption kind of waste stuff, right? But in the context of this fly, it is money. So this first stack, I want it to be uh, probably the densest of them all because it's also going to be a collar. And it's going to kind of bridge that gap. And you can see the hair, they bleed over that hook point just ever so slightly. And what's really cool about that, when you draw this silicone back into the fly, depending on your cover, you can see this is a pretty short head. And I can catch that point pretty easily. I could do a full silicone weak guard and fish this in the heaviest cover you can imagine fairly safely. And then the silicone would just move out of the way. It doesn't have a lot of rigidity to it. But I'm going to pack this pretty high tight. And you can use the same technique with the bucktail of spinning your thread counterclockwise. I got premium accuracy tight against my fingers. Pull it straight down. Don't let it rotate. Just two turns and it's nice and high tight right on top. Come in with my weight here. Again, this first stack is going to basically be the thickest. And check this out. I'll show you a little trick here that I literally just came up with on the fly. If you poke your bodkin through here, you can separate this left and right. And then when you drop that down, it's literally going to split my hook. Oh, nice. That? And that way you don't fight that. Cinch that straight down. That's it. I'm not going to put too many more turns on that. I'm going to bring my thread up and around. You can see that little wiggle. It just helps fibers that are caught on it kind of break off. Take your time here. Get that thread in front. And then just pack it back. Now right here, that, that material was pretty high and tight. And it might have had a little bit, you know, going up the sides. But I want a pretty round head. If you look at this head, it's, it's very round and symmetrical, just like a tube jig. And it's pretty perfect for gobies. And what I do is you take the color seam and you just pinch really hard. And it'll literally just draw thread up under the thread tension and make it 360 degrees. Now, I don't have to worry really about that thread loosening. And I'll kind of explain why in this next one because it, it failed to or failed to remind myself when I was doing it. So check this out. I'm just going to make sure those are oriented. I'm going to pack that right on top here. Again, you can see it right here at the lead eyes. You're going to be able to see just how high and tight that is, top and bottom. It's nice how easy that fills gaps compared to a synthetic where you have to almost fill in the what I always call the cheeks. You know, yeah, it, it it's is just very cool. How it it's so out. dense. Yeah, that's awesome. So when I get that thread in there, it's when I brought it up and around, it's under a lot of tension. When I take thread forward and then thread back, I've uh, you know, I've went forward and then locked over top, so the under threads can't relax, right? It's, I didn't come in front and then let go of my bobbin, and now when I pull on this, that thread can back up. That'd be an absolutely terrifying situation, because when you hit this with your comb at the end, you're going to rip all of your hair out. So as soon as I caught that, everything's under tension, I bring it up and around, like four or five turns forward, four or five turns back, and now I can sit here and reef on this, and the tension that's on that material doesn't back off. I'm just moving it underneath the tension that's already yeah. applied. It locked not, off. Yep. Yeah, I'm not decreasing any of the the uh, structural. You know, it's not going to pull out basically. Let me see here. So you can see this is pretty straightforward. I'm literally filling this whole shank here with wool. 
And it would be terrifying to cast this without the silicone. This would be a lot of water weight. <laughs> While you're tying that, I'll, I'm going to answer a question or two we had. Uh, Spencer asked about what kind of forge we're, we're focusing on here. Now, Gunnar talked a little bit about this being, you know, kind of a two-fold option for you. One, which he's tying here, is kind of a, a tractor bait fish imitator style fly. Um, tube jigs, if, you, if you're not from, if you've never done the conventional bass fishing and i'll admit i haven't done enough of it probably it's it's really flexible style of fly where you can pop down things on top of a hook and imitate what you want whether it's uh crayfish or bait fish and you can glide them right along the bottom or bounce them right off of stuff yeah they're really a nice versatile fishing tube jigs pretty easy kids can do it it's just dragging it along the bottom or like you said gliding it and around here, we use a lot for the goby pattern. So, you know, coffee-colored tube jigs and anything with that olive color, pumpkin seed, um, that sort of thing. You know, just match match the, the colors that you'd like exactly. uh, for your local streams. Yeah. But, gosh, you know, for for bass or any predator fishing, you can't go wrong with chartreuse and white. No. You know, as so the attractor pattern. I, I heard it might not be any use it ain't no use <laughs> if it ain't chartreuse it's an old saying that <laughs> it's just fun to say so. but i think chartreuse is probably an underfished color and tr people are trying to figure out you know we we subsist on these formulas if you will for for color choice you know dark water dark you know dark day dark fly and chartreuse is just this outlier but it just seems to work i mean it gets their attention i you know, we just have to remember that fish see the world a little bit differently than we do. So everybody's Absolutely. so worried about it being, you know, <clears throat> imitative, accurate, you know, so if you will. So I'll, I'll share yeah. something here. Um, so I'm obviously a huge fan of Match the Hatch. If you watch a lot of my channel, uh, I've been on this huge coffee-colored kick. Let me jump cameras here. I've literally been tying basically in browns and coffees and like tanicky colors for literally like two years straight because that is my water color and it is every bait fish in that freaking river <laughs> looks like a chocolate bar i'm not sure. kidding <laughs> and uh what's really interesting uh, when i took fish biology they were doing this study on uh, northern pike and they basically put you know a pike is in this swim tank and they put whatever like 50 minnows in there and they dyed one of the minnows they dyed him like yellow or chartreuse or pink the pike ate them first and really? it has nothing. Really? So it's like, check this out. Cause the pike, if you have like 50 minnows schooled together, it's really hard to see one and isolate it and pick it out. Sure. That's but if the, he can that see that a yellow one and he can mentality. track it visually against a, a group of individuals, then he can isolate it and kill it. That's And cool. so weird colors, like they have a place as far as predators, especially apex predators, they, it's their job to check things out, and they can only check it out with their mouth. And if it <laughs> looks and has the silhouette of a fish, but it's a unique color, not only can they find it and kill it and isolate it, like there's no way it can blend in. It's a it's super visual stimulus where it's like, how do you turn that down? <laughs> everything, so cool. you've ever tried to eat, everything you've ever tried to eat in your entire life is designed to blend in. Right. And here's one thing. And you're like, you're dead. You're dead. Yeah. You <laughs> right. don't stand a chance. I'm going to kill you. I'm taking you out of the population. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't belong here. So <laughs> weird colors have their place big time. Uh, I, I, I should probably cite that. It was in my fish biology class. I, I, <laughs> buy, buy the $400 textbook or whatever they charge. If you, if you feel bored enough to find a citation <laughs> at, in the midst of your Minnesota winter, let me know. I'll put it in the video, but I don't think. <laughs> so uh, another, if you want to get matched the hatchy, uh, obviously you guys mentioned this is very goby -ish. Sure. Bottom dwellers are designed to match the bottom structure. So if you know the bottom of your river, if it's sandy, it should be a light tan. If you have weird moss on the rocks, it should be a grainy moss. Like the bottom structure typically dictates the color of the bottom dwellers. Right. That's the whole point. Yep. And what's really cool is then you take that bottom dweller. I always get this question when I tie sculpin patterns because I might like a zoo cougar, like you tie a sculpin pattern with a deer head and people are like, 
how are you supposed to fish that on the bottom? It's like, I'm not. It's not <laughs> supposed to be on the bottom. It's supposed to be this recognizable silhouette that they can identify yes. a forage, and it's supposed to be out of place. Yeah. It's supposed, oh. They wouldn't we're, go we're running kill it if it was CFS. in its place. <laughs> Sculpin bashed his head in on a rock, and he's floating up in the surface. Like, kill it. <laughs> it's not always about being perfect. Like, that's very dry fly. Like, I have to have this drift. You right. know, this drag free drift that has to look like the real thing or they're gonna turn down. That's a lot different than I'm trying to kill something that's half my you know, body length and I'm trying to fill my belly. Right. Yeah. It's not the yeah. same. Yeah, if we but match them too talk. well, the fish won't find them. <laughs> I'm gonna eat once every two weeks and it's gonna be big. <laughs> that's the attitude. <laughs> All right, here. I'll get back in this. I'm gonna code this thing out, which is gonna be crazy, and then we have uh, to give it let's see. the nastiest hairdo. Awesome. I'm looking forward to this. While you're switching there, we did have a question about uh, what makes... Uh, I'm going to just rephrase this from... Uh, uh, H. Hren the Great uh, is asking, uh, what's, what makes ostrich hurl premium versus not premium? So I'm just describing the length. Um, when I talk about premium ostrich, a lot of times... Let me see if I can find one. You get these short little chubby things. Yeah. You see, like, it just keeps going. You see that? I'm trying to line the stems up here a little bit. And so I'm, I'm grading that solely based off the length relative to its application. That makes sure. sense. I think um, I see it, too, at least. I mean, we part of our jobs is seeing a lot of materials come in, and usually you can see a big difference in width too per uh, fiber, you know, makes a huge difference because that's going to grab current. It's going to add motion. Literally, literally the, the, the width of the individual. Yes. Right. Happen, that, if, that's right? very noticeable to the us sometimes. The yeah. It's going to be much and more buggy. And you know, I mean, it's this double edged sword. You get all these cool colors, but some dyes are more difficult on materials yep. especially something that's the fine. density in the finest yeah of the some, sometimes. especially something as fine as ostrich and we see it sometimes with the barred ostrich that we carry sometimes it's a little thinner i mean it'll still move really well but if you're looking for a really dense fiber you know yeah that's, that's nice and long you can, this that's is super long uh the stuff at the top this is my favorite it has tapered tips way up really here you can risky. see just how thin the tips are that's super sexy with that's the channel kinda, material whoo. Ooh, and if you look at the difference, this is super. Look how thick that yeah. is. Yeah. Wow. Right. So this is like, and I. It depends on what you're using it for. Obviously, I typically would use the tapered, thinner tips for a tailing material, and, and streamer tying. I'd use that for tailing material, and I'd use this for basically filling in bucktail up front as a collar because sure. it's going to be thicker and webbier and fill it in. And I tend to just and like when I showed that beast fly. I tend to have more opaque heads that block sunlight fully and very thin, wispy tails. Yeah. You can that's ostrich right there. Nice thin wispy ostrich in the tail. And of course that thing is thirteen inches long. <laughs> but it serves the same same purpose right. for the discussion. <clears throat> so I'd just grade it on length because if you try to tie an ostrich tail and you want it to be five inches and you buy premium select ostrich and it's three inches long, you're like, uh <laughs> I guess I'll put it in a dubbing loop and use it as a collar. There you go. That's my <laughs> so, but I'm going to pick this out, and you'll see uh, I'm picking it out at 90 degrees, like very aggressively, uh, so that my, my scissors will cut into the fiber. If you lay it all back, one of the things that happens with any head when you try to trim it, but it'll literally just, your scissors will push it down as you cut, and you cannot get accurate cuts becomes really like frustrating to try to trim something with a high degree of accuracy. Now you need to be careful with that because I don't want to trim my collar. So you'll see I'll kind of fade that collar back in the mid body, but I have the head super bushy, but I want I don't want to cut that off or else I'm going to totally bosh the silhouette. Now anytime you trim, it's really important to have a reference point. And right now I have none. And most people they trim the bottom first, but I always like to just make a cone so that I can see that hook eye I can kind of see that nice rounded tube silhouette just from the get-go. And so this is literally like my scissors are at a fixed angle, and I'm just rotating the vise and just chopping away. 
and I build a nice perfect cone. Like everybody can do that. Nobody's going to mess that up. And now I can see what I need to do. So we're going to drop to the underside. It's just kind of like trimming deer hair. You need reference points, you need flat angles, and then you just round everything out. So I'm going to hold the collar back so I don't ruin it. I'm going to pull up the hair that needs to be cut so I have a more aggressive angle against my scissors. I'm going to rest that potentially against my hook eye or even against my other hand now that that's slicked back and just get a nice kind of flat cut on the underside wow, that I can clean. use to, to gauge yeah, the fly. Yeah, easy, Brian, just like trimming deer hair, right? Right. <laughs> it's a lot less dirty than Oh, yeah, deer easy. Hair. <laughs> I'll tell you that. I'm just trying not to mess this up on live TV Oh, here. no. And you can see how critical it is to preen it out and away. Whatever you want to cut, preen it away. Don't try to get in there with your tips and make it do what you want because you're going to dig in, cut it, ruin everything. You have to protect the collar. You have to pull away what you want to clean up, and then you have to trim it out of there. And so like that, that's a fishable belly. I'm obviously going to clean it up more, but that's a fishable belly for a standpoint of, of trimming it. This head is beyond bushy, which is legit. This is just one of those things you have to screw up about 50,000 times. <laughs> it really is. I can't. <laughs> it, it, no, I'm, I'm laughing because I totally agree with you. We've all done it. And, you know, I, everyone's heard me say it. It's I know I'm a broken record. If you want to learn how to do something, isolate it. You know, if if you have the ability to do that, I mean, how expensive is just an empty shank, a pair of dumbbell eyes, and some Icelandic sheep or some wool? You know, just just tr teach yourself to just do the head and isolate it from the rest of the fly, and it will pay off. So the the beautiful thing here is, if you do dig into any of it, you just oh, I dropped my. Drop my brush here. So you can totally clean this up, fill it in. Wool does such a good job of filling in any mistakes, really. And we're going to make sure that we can kind of trim this down as premium as I can get it here. i got to stop using that word. We started talking about ostrich, and I, I keep was, saying How am I going to say anything? <laughs> this is uh... this bait fish pattern is premium. It is so good. <laughs> We're going to, I think, uh, you know, next year, since I'm getting Brian a, a board of sound effects and stuff, <laughs> we're going to isolate you saying, now that is premium. And that'll be one of our sound effects. <laughs> one of our sound bites. <laughs> so I just cleaned up the eye. I used little vertical cuts here. Something you can do, I would consider it cheating, but I might do it. You just use a little bit of zap, hit it in that head, and then while it's curing, you push your bodkin against it to make a nice, clean, leading edge here. Because you get to fill all that in with silicone anyway. So you might as well make it as clean as you can. That's it a nice tip the... right yeah, there. That's good. Did you guys hear that sound right there? It's Which the worst did. sound in fly tying. That was my scissors dropping point Ooh. down onto my hard stone floor. That's awesome. So, that's, 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 <laughs> I've retired. I've probably retired 15 pairs of scissors over the years that way. Ah, oh, we're good. Oh, we're good. Yay. Tragedy <laughs> narrowly averted. <laughs> Dented beyond belief. All right. So this is the part that no one's going to be probably familiar with, which is the silicone application. Now, silicone is tacky as all get out. And basically what you're going to do, imagine you had some goop on your finger and you were trying to get it off, right? You're literally going to like rub it off your finger under the material. Now, to get the super clean, ultra smooth finish because it's tacky, the do, uh, Gunner, do you mean the premium finish? <clears throat> That's exactly what I'm talking sorry. about. <laughs> sorry, I can't help myself. <laughs> You're killing me, small. All right, I'll stop. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm so I'm, I'm out of focus now. I'm lost. <laughs> so to get that super like crystal clean finish here, uh, you use something called a wetting agent, and you're basically putting a barrier between your finger and the silicone so that it doesn't stick. You get a nice slippery overcoat, and it literally comes out like a, a soft plastic here. I'm trying to make sure that's in focus. Now, there's a really nice product you can buy. You can get it at camera stores. It's called Kodak Photo Flow Solutions. 
you get this like one pound bottle, 16 ounces, that's going to last you your whole life because you're only going to use it to tie flies. <laughs> now you can do something else, which is use saliva. Now, obviously, please do not put your finger in your mouth and then touch silicone and then put it back in your mouth. We Disclaimer, are smarter than that. Don't do that. S spit into a glass or a cup. I'm actually going to use my saliva because it's harder and I feel like that's more authentic because most people are probably going to try that. <clears throat> so this is silicone. It is clear. That's an important variable here because you can get it colored and that would be a big thing. If you use markers to countershade a fly, it will bleed like crazy into the silicone. It okay. will just, over time, like I'm talking like a month or two, if you used a black marker, the whole head would be pitch black. Really? It'll, okay. it'll just That's continue. Good to know. I don't know how it works. After it's cured, it just keeps bleeding. So hmm. That's you know, a good point. Make a big old... Yeah, we did actually have a dab. question about markers. We'll touch on later, but... Gotcha. So here's a big dab. I don't know, you know, a dab. <laughs> and I'm literally just going to start brushing that into that head. And again, this takes all the friction out of the head, which is super cool to have because it's just slippery as all get out. It gives it all the glide that you could hope for. You can use it to make the fly as weedless as you want. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to hold it back to the exact shape I want. We Let used to use a it. lot of uh, soft text for stuff like this, and I like the silicone much better. It's way more viscous. Yeah. Way yeah. more viscous. Doesn't absorb as much, and it's not going to kill all of your brain cells super quickly. Soft tax is some serious stuff, oh, man. It's serious. <laughs> I have a respirator. <laughs> or not. Yeah, or not. Know. Yeah. And you can see I'm just, I mean, you got to go slow. Work your way around it. I got that rag. I'm, I'm wiping I mean, my fingers off. There's plenty of working time there. Oh, you have, you literally have probably 30 minutes before yeah. it kind of sets up on you. You're not in a huge rush. And so you can see it's just kind of like, it's pretty clean, but it's a little bit muddy, a little bit just distorted, ever so slightly. And so what you'll do here is just take a finishing touch. And I'm just going to incorporate this right on the hook eye here. I'll just put a layer that goes all the way around the fly. And what's really sick is this stuff costs like, I don't know, you know, five bucks for a tube of silicone. You're not going to break the bank. No. It's now, not here's my go little bad either. <clears throat> right. My my spit depository. So don't watch because it's a little, you know, <clears throat> unkosher. <laughs> but there's some nice saliva. Get your finger wet. Obviously, don't do this after you just ate a bunch of food or something. That would be disgusting. Drink a glass of water before you spit into a cup. Something like. Doritos, Fiery Locos. And you can see that. That would be so... <laughs> it's impregnated. So Doritos. <laughs> it's a scented and fly. I can't I'm stop. Like, I don't know if you can see that glassy, smooth finish, but that saliva just blocks it from sticking to your hand, and you can really get it in there and work it nice and clean. Yeah, and what I'll do here is I'll just right up. dry my finger off a little bit so I can kind of fade and bleed that that edge into the fly. And that is a legit chartreuse and white weedless tube fly. Man, <laughs> Not tube cool. fly, that tube is sharp. Fluffers. So that's what I got. That's awesome. I like the whole rattle concept at the bottom. We actually had a question actually I'm glad you brought that up, Brian. Uh, if if someone does not have rattles, would you would you incorporate some weight, any uh, lead or anything like that? So the hooks don't need anything to keel. Um, when I was when I intro the hook, I, I showcased the the little bit of offset that it has, and you have to understand that whole that 90 degree angle is your lever arm so that your 45 and everything underneath literally has that degree more leverage on it. That's why it doesn't just come straight down off that, that bend. Okay. And so literally, if you were to look at this, the whole fly's tied in line 
The hole flies in line. It's extended off that shank. All of this is keel weight, keel weight, keel weight, keel weight, except this little bit of hook point. The only thing that's not keel weight is that little bit of hook point that rides up above the plane. Man, that's and so crazy. the rattle's just there to be a rattle. Um, what is kind of cool is the rattle is on the inside of the wire. So when you drag that on the bottom on rocks or zebra mussels, you're not going to break it or damage that rattle because it's protected inside that wire harness. And yet it's still below that axis. So even on the inside, it's still keel weight functionally, even though it's just kind of there for the sake of having a rattle. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Brian, your flies are all this thought out, right? No, not at all. <laughs> Mine either. My flies take no time at all. <laughs> Mine are guide flies. They are, you know. Disposable, right? To be, I mean... They're designed to fish once. Yeah, <laughs> they, that's they're awesome. They're going to end up in a tree on the bottom or in my ear. <laughs> yeah. uh, you had me write down to talk yeah. briefly about <laughs> casting heavy flies like this. And, you know, there's different types of heavy flies, whether it's weight on there or whether they're absorbent, but sure. we all use a little bit different technique for that. It's not your uh, not your dry fly presentation. Usually. So it would be interesting so. to hear your guys' thoughts on this. Um, <clears throat> but obviously I don't want to teach you something. It has a one gram lead eye in there, and then silicone, and then it has natural materials. Like it's not super light. You see what I'm saying? Right. And if you take this and you throw it on your fly, five weight and you do something like this, oh, man, is that going to hurt like hell. Okay? <laughs> I'm ducking yeah. thinking of it. <laughs> so there's two things that I would bring up if you've never casted anything like this. The first is a Belgium cast. And all you have to know about that is this is your typical fly cast, right? It's a perfectly straight line, basically. Every the Belgium time. cast oh, yeah. arcs. You see, it literally arcs. And the fly line does what the dip does. So when you arc that back, the fly line draws a nice oval out to the back. It carries the weight away from your rod tip, which is super important. The other thing it does, depending on your your length of line that you have out, you can store the energy kind of kinetically into the rod. And so you don't actually have to do, depending on your, your distance you're trying to cast, the typical start stop. Because the big issue you get with a weighted fly is when you go back, and I tend to, I open stance cast anyway, but when you go back, it's going to jerk on the end of that line. And when it jerks, it recoils and that right. imparts slack. And it's going to screw the whole system up aside from giving you ridiculous tumble, tennis slack elbow hurting your shoulder. not your friend. As soon as it recoils, it's bad news. So if you are able to, and you're fishing maybe 30 feet, 35 feet, that Belgium cast, you can store it. It's literally like a one smooth motion. And so there's never a stop start. But if you're going for distance, let's say you were still water fishing, you wanted to bomb a 70, 80 foot cast, you would do your typical start stop. But what you want to do is when that goes back, you don't wait for it to tug. That's a pretty big misconception of fly casting. If you wait for the tug, you've technically lost energy. And that recoil is going to be significant with a weighted fly. And so as that loop is turning over, open stance casting on a boat, I can see that loop and I can anticipate it and I can transition that energy into the cast in a nice smooth motion. So you never wait for the recoil. Even if you're carrying, you know, 40 or 50 feet of line, you still integrate that weight into the casting stroke. Because if you let it bounce, it's game over. I'd say... I know. I think the simplest thing anyone can do if they're they're starting to cast heavier flies, don't go for that super long hero cast right off the bat. It's just gonna, it's just, <laughs> it's not gonna go well. Like anything, start at a reasonable distance and slowly add distance from there. It's just get comfortable with yeah. it and use an appropriate weight rod. So speaking yeah. of that, which weight rod? Yeah, we actually would you, uh... Dave Sexton asked, uh, what weight rod would you recommend for this? <laughs> <clears throat> I would recommend probably a six weight. It's going to be standard six or seven. Okay. Um, because it's weighted, you don't actually need a very heavy line to throw it. So it's not like you need the momentum of an eight weight line to carry it because the fly will carry itself because it has that, that lead eye in it. It's very low friction. I could cast this fairly comfortably on my four weight. It'll actually go. I could probably cast that 70, 80 feet on a four weight. Uh, just because of the the fact that it's weighted, 
And what's going to be really nice about that, again, it's going to be a smooth stroke. My forewight is actually really nice and soft. Uh, I don't need the weight of the fly line to carry it because it is a weighted fly. It's not like a big air suck. You know, the biggest thing, you get into flies like this, and it's like if, if this is weightless, I can't cast it. Like my right. foreweight will stop after 10 feet. Like you can't even load the rod because when you go to release, it's just slowing the system down. You can't even get your head to turn over, right? So this is the situation where you're like, I need a 10 weight. I need 400 grains, 30 feet long, super short front taper just to be able to get a nice 50 foot cast with a 14 inch fly or something. When you're talking about these low profile, low ring resistance, a little bit of weight, this, this brings into the topic of Mark Sadati's weight balance and... I'll just talk about it really quick because there's sure. a caveat to this that We've people don't they don't seem to internalize, but it's it's weighting a fly relative to its air resistance. It's very simple. Weight relative to resistance. Because when you this whole weight balancing thing, if you if you don't know what I'm talking about, I filmed so many videos I kind of forget to go into it all the time, but it's like it's a sliding scale. And what you have to understand is I tend to show the biggest scale. I show the most extreme end of the spectrum because I'm tying a musky fly that's – come here, you ridiculous thing. Let me show you this because this is what it's about. Okay, so I'm tying – let's say literally it's, it's probably 13 inches long. It's big. This has so much wind resistance that if I do not weight it, I cannot cast it. Now, as you increase the weight, you increase the momentum of the fly. We talked about how – uh, if I cast this weightless beast, I have to go up line sizes just to have momentum to overcome the wind resistance. Right. Well, you don't have to use the line to do that. I can add weight to the fly. Now the fly has momentum in the fly. I don't have to rely on the fly line. And you reach a point where this has enough weight that the wind resistance is negated. The wind resistance doesn't impact the line. And so then it flies with the fly line. It's no longer being pulled. It's literally soaring with it, and they're deaccelerating at the same rate. Mommy. That's so my kiddo's <laughs> getting ready for bed. <laughs> I miss those days. <laughs> it's super awesome. And so this is the extreme end. This has four grams of lead in it. Four grams. It has like literally 22 inches of 030 lead wire wrapped on the shank. Wow. Now that sounds ridiculous. But I can it literally, if you like, th you can throw it like a baseball and it'll just go. And again, using this technique of anticipating that loop turning over, being able to carry lines, smooth transitions, incorporating that energy of the weight into the cast to load the rod, it just goes. It just goes. And what you have to understand about this is this sliding scale of this extreme end, it applies all the way down to dry flies. And Mark Sadati gives an example. You see people at like a casting pool at a show or something, and they have a little piece of yarn on there, and they can't get this stupid piece of yarn to turn over no matter what they're doing, and it's because it doesn't have the weight of the hook. Right. It literally does not have that little bit of weight of the hook. Now, obviously, not all flies are weight balanced. Like a big hopper pattern on a lightweight dry fly hook is a bushy little fly on a little tiny hook. You see what I'm saying? Right. And <clears> – <throat> Anyway, this fly, <laughs> it brings me to the whole point that this fly, it doesn't need to be stepped up to be castable because of the weight that negates the wind resistance. So it becomes accessible to all rod weights that you're comfortable. And so the rod weight should be geared towards the fish so that you can fight them appropriately, land them quickly, release them, yada, yada, yada. And so you can just have fun with it. Because like I would, without a doubt, put this on my four weight, catch a little 12-inch smallmouth and be happy as clam and you know, go on and whatever. So Perfect. I would recommend a six weight. It'll feel pretty good on you, but everything is open because it has a nice little amount of weight to it. While so, you mentioned, I'm going to hit a button here that I've never, oh, that's kind of cool. I forgot I've to clean the hook. I have, I'm hitting I have buttons here. here. We got uh, <clears throat> a question here from Aaron, uh, who has heard you mention Mark Sadati, and I know that Russ mentioned Mark as well. Um, he's asking, you know, What's something, what's a good resource to find some info on him? And he's, got, I mean, what's the, I'm trying to think of the fly, of course. The, uh, the Sadati Slammer. The Slammer. It's, uh, yeah. yeah. That's so the, that, that's the that's place to start, Aaron. Is. Well, this, this is the Yak Slammer. So the Slammer is like his whole series. And he's got a Trout Slammer and a Feathered Slammer. And he has, it's all just the different scales, you know, five inches, seven inches, 10 inches, 12 inches, whatever. Um, I don't actually know. 
I was at I was at the the Macomb Expo like two years ago, and Tommy Lynch was there, and he gave me Mark Sadati's phone number, <laughs> and then <laughs> Sadati and I had a conversation this summer on the porch that lasted like two hours, and so I just talked to Mark now, and so. Uh, you know, Mark is, is becoming kind of one of my mentors in, in fly tying. Um, he does have a few YouTube videos. Uh, um, not a ton. Not as much as, not no, as much. There's like you three. or I There do. might be like yeah. three. Yeah. Um, and, and so a good person to, well, I guess I don't know how to just get you in touch with Mark without giving some personal details away. No, no. Uh, I mean, there's, that's what Google's for. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he's got YouTube videos. He's got a YouTube yeah. video on the Feather Slammer and the Yak Slammer. He's got, if you Google weight balancing flies, you'll probably see my face, which is okay. But he's got articles, I think, in the, the River Sage Journal. I think that's accurate. The River Sage Journal, he wrote a nice article on weight balancing flies where a lot of this initial information came from. Um, and he was recently on the SVS, uh, Shenago, Sh- Shenago Valley Shenanigans. I always forget SBS, the first name. SBS, right? Yeah. Um, yes. He was just on their podcast about two weeks back. So, um, yeah. we're gonna slow. We're gonna slowly uh, wrap some things up. But first thing I want to, you know, have Gunner talk about briefly is your business. You, I mean, you oh. have the ability to do this for work, which. We're spoiled to, to do right. as well, uh, but you get to tie for a living, and uh, how is that? It's miserable. <laughs> <laughs> tying for a living is not fun. Are you kidding me? Um, so I mean, I, I knew I the answer to that. <laughs> I didn't supply you with all the information. That was a, a little bit of a, a trick question here. Um, so when, uh, what was this? Like seven years ago, I was a college kid. And I got an internship working for Kelly Gallup, and I went and I lived literally like 100 feet from the Madison River. And that was spoiled, like beyond belief, I was spoiled beyond belief. And, of course, I'd listen to every word Kelly said. And uh, after that summer, I finished my degree in wildlife ecology, and I started an internship as a wildlife ecologist. And I told Kelly, like, I ain't coming back. I got to have a real job. I got to be a professional, yada, yada, yada. Well, that was seasonal work. And as soon as that season was over, I was like, ah, shoot, I'm a fish bum. <laughs> like, here it is. Like, right? this is the destiny. And so my wife still married me, even though I was a bum. And we moved to Duluth because this is where her job was. And she looked at me one day and she's like, so when are you going to start selling flies? Like, when's it going to happen? And That's that was awesome. That was the That's moment. So, so cool. I jumped in full tilt. I wrote some articles for Flymen. That was kind of like my foot in the door. I started selling flies commercially. And then we had a kid. The kid's like two and a half now. And I, I tried my darndest for like the first year having a kid, you know, like time flies till midnight until I was <laughs> ready to drop dead, basically. And then I was like, I'm out. <laughs> and so you guys don't know this maybe, but I haven't sold the fly in about a year and a half now. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, that's what I meant, but I, di- I didn't prep you with all the information. No, yeah. And so... My business has YouTube, teaching classes, traveling, doing shows, um, and obviously um, you should support your local fly shop. Like it's absolutely critical because that's how the industry goes and continues. Uh, but I have now a very small kind of niche streamer only oriented fly shop basically in my office behind me. So cool. That's yeah. that's very cool. That's really cool. That's the full story. Literally, flying ties for a living sucks. I don't know. I don't know. Anybody just... can do it. You can't do it. We, and we don't mean to discourage everyone, but I know a lot of folks are like, yeah, I'll just do this, and it's that's I mean, a lot of work. It's it's not for you. It's I the fun factor how kind much of Jerry disappears. Reagan <laughs> oh man, or Dennis Potter tie every year. Yeah, you know, like just hundreds of thousands of flies it just would be too much too tedious for me couldn't do it and the thing you know the thing that gets me really excited is not selling flies to somebody that doesn't get me excited but teaching somebody because i okay when i worked for kelly the second day i caught if you literally walk like 200 yards up from the slide there's this sick little bend there's a little back shoot where a little bit of overflow came in, and I stuck a, like my first 14-inch brown on a zoo cougar right there at that little honey hole, and that was the last fly or that was the last fish I've caught on a commercially tied fly. 
from that moment on, I have only ever fished my own flies. Every fish I've ever caught in the past seven years has been on my fly. Now, it might be somebody else's pattern or a variation sure. of it. I'm not trying to say, like, I designed everything the, on the planet. That's <laughs> bull crap. But, like, I fish my own stuff, and that's where the passion is because, man, when you stick a fish on an idea, like, you could have caught 15 fish. I could care less. I caught one fish on my idea. I, I win. Yeah. Like, oh, there's something that. to I that. There I is love definitely it. something to that. <laughs> and when you can teach people that and then they have that experience, that's wicked cool. Like, I'd rather teach you how to tie flies. And it's so rewarding. And help that's, you on that's that process what, because what's, yeah. I mean that helps us survive is the education. And if you look back this, here, so. you can see all these. I start. I, I make lures too. I tie jigs and make bucktail inline spinners, and I still gear fish. And like it doesn't like my buddy was just here a week ago, and he's like, okay, so I have this idea, and we're sitting down, we're tying trolling flies for Great Lake salmon. Like we're just screwing around because I have all the stuff to make my own lures. Like I just that's what it's about, kind of at that point. Yeah, absolutely. It's all part of the process, without yeah. question. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Gunnar. We man. really we appreciate uh, super appreciative of this doing yeah. this with us tonight, and you know, it's all part of that whole kind of that fly shop strong, and and if we all stick together and band together. It's a small industry, um, for sure. And you know. All these big I'm just tickled to death that you guys had me, man. Oh, man. Oh, this, man. You're, you are my fly Dude, shop. you're like hometown. <laughs> hometown. I'm from Traverse City. I used right. to ride my bike to Kurt's <laughs> shop. I was literally like 15 years old. I just wander around his store. I never bought anything. And then I'd go fish hopper droppers behind the dam and catch rock bass. Right. Yep. I, I'm sure he was annoyed as hell with me. No. And then, like, I took my first class with Lafkus. And then, like, you know, that's you been my whole that. I mean, that's, I can't it's believe, you, you know, you survived Alex back in the day, too. <laughs> he, and, are you kidding me? He set me down the wrong path, man. <laughs> he taught me how to tie a streamer. By the end of the class, I was so giddy, like, the whole week. Or I guess it was, like, once a week, whatever. By the end of the class, he brought me out back behind the shop, and he had this box. And I'm sure it was his junk box, but I was so giddy. He just gave it to me. He's like, here's all the materials I'm never going to use. Here you go. And I was like, I got home. I'm like, Mom, Dad, look. Like, I got bear fur and rabbit feet and <laughs> feathers coming out of this stuff. Like, he he supplied me for, like, the next five years with fly fishing material. That's hilarious. So, I don't He's know if a great guy. He's awesome. I'm sure he remembers. Um, yeah, and I was just fishing, you know, steelhead with your father this, this uh, past fall. And so, you know, he's really proud of you, too. So. Oh nonsense! He does. He does miss you guys. I will say that. That poor guy. I, <laughs> I was so surprised. I was sitting at the house because my parents still live in Traverse City, so I'm there like once or twice a year. And I was practicing. I was sh practicing with my new shooting head in the yard, and he picked it up and cast it, and I was like, "Holy crap! Like you can actually cast! Like okay, like you know, he's a golfer. He golfs all the time. That's what he thinks about. Yep, he and is so a I just, golfer. And it's not like he's a passionate fly fisherman he he enjoys it he enjoys the company he enjoys the activity he probably enjoys it because i enjoy it so that's like you know a bonding thing and i was tickled to death that he could actually cast a fly rod semi-decently because man you go to some some shows and that's not, that's not the average joe right there no he he's a very gifted athlete when it comes to that probably because his golf game is so good he knows the timing of the cast it's all in the hips man yeah. it's all in the hips <laughs> just thinking happy it's, it's a universal <laughs> athletic thing it it's really is hips. absolutely open stance cast get up shoot that sucker out there do a little tim ray jeff like whatever you gotta do man absolutely well thanks again gunner we really appreciate it yeah last thing uh if people want to reach out to you i know you're on instagram at gunner bramer and you have a fantastic youtube channel everyone should check out as well yes. just check out is it uh gunner bramer or bramer's custom flies quiz time if, if you search, search them both find it. yeah honestly <laughs> i think it's the tardy duck one okay i think that it was is my old school call <laughs> of duty <laughs> gamer <laughs> it's the tardy duck one that's the channel but if you just search gunner or whatever it'll come no big deal awesome prestige, baby all right well, thanks everybody um Really appreciate Gunnar being here this week. Thanks, man. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Uh, yes. If you haven't done so, think about hitting that subscribe button. Remember, this will be available for replay. You can go back uh, and leave us comments and questions, and we'll 
we'll push them on to Gunner and uh, yeah. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks everybody. Stay healthy, uh, stay safe, and we'll see you next week.